Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us at this panel discussion on Brexit. My name is Tim Ross, and I am a journalist in London with Bloomberg. And I'm delighted to say we've got an excellent panel here. It's quite a big panel. Um, so what I'm going to do is just pass this microphone along and then ask uh, my colleagues up here to introduce themselves quickly so that you can all know who they are. Um, so actually, do you have a microphone there? And so when, Is it Hello, my name's Aileen and I'm here from Scotland. I live in Glasgow. Um, normally I work as an English tutor, but I also have experience as an activist. So I'm excited to bring a Scottish context today because as I'm sure many of you are aware, it's very different to the British mainstream narrative that you're seeing in the news. Hello, I'm Nick Archer. I'm the British ambassador here in Prague where I've been since January. Um, previously, I did a similar job in Denmark and before that on Malta. So this is my third European Union member state. Thank you. Uh, hello, good uh, evening everyone. My name is Zbigniew Smetana. I am a director of the EU Economic Policy Coordination Department at the Office of the Government and one of my tasks is a coordination of Czech position towards Brexit negotiation. Hello, my name is Agata Gostinska Jakubowska, and I am a senior research fellow at the Center for European Reform in London, but also with office in Brussels, and I deal with the EU institutions and Brexit. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Christophe Fillon, and I'm professor of European law at the universities of uh, Oslo and Leiden, and a research fellow at SNUPI, which is the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, and a research fellow at CEPS, which is the Swedish Institute for International, for, sorry, European Policy Studies. And in all these places, I've been looking as a lawyer at um, how Brexit has unfolded and how uh, Brexit has been handled by, by the European Union and its member states. Thank you all. Now, I hope everybody in the room knows who Boris Johnson is. <laughs> Lots of nodding. That's good. I know there's one man on the panel who definitely knows, and that's the ambassador. Um, but exactly two years ago, Boris Johnson was preparing for the final debate in the referendum campaign. And he declared, as he got on stage, that June the 23rd, which was the date that vote happened in 2016, was going to be Britain's Independence Day. Now, Boris, along with the rest of the country and the EU, is still waiting, actually, to find out exactly what Brexit's going to look like. The picture's been complicated by the fact that the UK had an election last year in which the Prime Minister lost her majority, which is making it quite a lot harder for the government and parliament to decide exactly what the UK wants to achieve in Brexit negotiations. Now, the clock is ticking, as Michelle Barnier is fond of saying, um, which, in fact, I think there are only 281 days left to go before the UK is due to leave on March the 29th next year. Um, some people think this means it might not happen. So I'm just going to ask everyone on this panel very quickly, yes or no, will Brexit happen? Starting with Christoph. Um, maybe. Uh, <laughs> That's not allowed. That's not allowed, all right. I, I, I think it will. Um, I think it will. Up. Yeah. I think it will for, for various reasons. Um, I think the EU27 have got acquainted with the idea that the UK is on course to leaving and has been handling the whole thing quite competently, I have to say, um, while at the same time moving in, uh, in, in, in other directions in terms of, of uh, policies, um, while the UK has been moving in, in another direction. Uh, so the gap is widening between EU and the UK, EU 27 and, and the UK. I don't have the feeling, although I don't follow these discussions very closely, that within Parliament and across society there's been a major change of views as regards, the, uh, as regards Brexit. Um, and that leads me to say perhaps um, Brexit should take place in this regard um, because um, things have moved on so much that it would be it would be a strange member state to come back uh, to the EU. I could elaborate on that later on, but okay. I don't want to take the microphone for too long. Shall I just say yes will, will Brexit happen? Yes, no. 
So I, I think I will disappoint all the pro-Europeans in this room who would like to see the UK in the EU. I think that most probably uh, the UK will at least formally leave the EU on, on, on March 29, 2019. Aileen. Um, the short answer I have is, as a realist, yes, uh, the UK is going to be leaving the EU. As an optimist, of course, I would love to answer no. As a pro-European, I would love to answer no. Um, but my hope is that this certainly doesn't spell the end of a European identity um, and very meaningful cooperation uh, certainly between Scotland and our European neighbours, if not between the UK and our European neighbours. Yes. Full marks, Nick. I will be also brief. Uh, I think yes, and it will be ordinarily Brexit, and we will reach an agreement, probably at the very last moment, but I believe in it. Thank you all. Uh, if, by the way, at any point, you guys would like to submit a question. We have this Slido app here. I don't know if anyone's using it, but please go ahead and put your questions into that. They will appear on the screen and uh, then we can take them. There will also be 20 minutes at the end where we can take questions from uh, the room. But Agatha, you said yes, and you also um, uh, seemed to have perhaps a, a slightly heavy heart about it, but I, I wondered if you could, if you could say, the, the, the pro-European cause in the UK seems to be on the back foot today, particularly. Is it just hopeless, do you think, from, from their perspective? Do you think there's really no chance now for, say, a second referendum? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. I think, indeed, the pro-Europeans, particularly um, pro-European Tories, are now on the back foot. I'm not sure whether you, you are following a British discussion that closely, but yesterday there was a significant vote in the British Parliament um, and uh, Parliament was actually trying to secure a greater role for itself in the Brexit negotiations in something that we call meaningful vote amendment and actually, um, uh, well, uh, Westminster was defeated, the government won that uh, vote. Now. In order for the referendum to happen, for another referendum to happen, you need the British Parliament um, to instruct the government to legislate for such a referendum, right? The problem is that neither the Conservative Party nor Labour leadership wants another referendum. If you read their manifestos, they have been very clear and on the record numerous times saying, we do respect the will of the British people, we will deliver Brexit. Now, the, of course, they differ on how the future relations should look like between the UK and the EU, but uh, both parties uh, do not want another referendum yet. And I'm saying yet because um, I mean, much depends, of course, political fate <laughs> of MPs depend on the public opinion. The thing is that the public opinion hasn't very much shifted on the question of either the second referendum or on the UK's membership in the EU. It's still kind of split in between. Now, when you talk to the campaigners, uh, people engaged, for example, in people's vote, they will rightly point, you have to look at the bright side and you have to look at those slight shifts that have taken place, particularly across the Labour uh, voters. So, for example, it looks like, and this is the latest YouGov poll, it looks like that almost around one million Labour voters who voted Leave in 2016 now seems to be thinking, well, maybe it wasn't such a good idea. The way the negotiations are going, you know, um, perhaps we would have think, we would have fought twice uh, uh, today. Now, there is also this demographic element coming up. If you talk to people much more better at data than I am, they will say, well, you know, the young people are now just coming to the fore. Those who didn't have a chance to vote two years ago, well, today, 
they would have had and probably they would vote for the UK to remain. So um, the, the problem is that this is still too little. This is not a significant shift for the Labour leadership um, to take another stance and to say, well, okay, let's, uh, let's try to nudge uh, the government or let's try to push uh, uh, for another referendum. Just a final note, I know, I know I've been too long-winded, and also, you know, you, you could argue that the current Labour leadership is not particularly interested in that. I think, you know, if you ask Jeremy Corbyn, he doesn't mind uh, that the UK is leaving the EU. So, um, yes, as it stands, I don't see big chances for the referendum to happen, but who knows? Thank you very much. Um, turning to Spinek, I was just going to ask you, actually, whether given that we all seem to think here that Brexit is, is on, um, at some, in, some, in some way at least by March 29th. Do you, what is the kind of Brexit that the uh, Czech Republic government would like to see? What, what would be a good Brexit for you? Have a... <laughs> it's a complicated with the mic, yes. Yeah, so, uh, our expectation from the Brexit, so, our wish is to have as smooth Brexit as possible, to eliminate all negative implications for the citizens, businesses. Uh, yes, the Brexit, that's uh, this integration process, so there will be some new obstacles, but our task, both on the EU side and in the UK side, is to eliminate these new obstacles and uh, negative implications for all. So that's, that's my idea of the Brexit, and uh, the Brexit will I think that Brexit will happen, that uh, the second referendum, it's not possible. What is possible, in my opinion, is uh, uh, some uh, uh, changing regarding the British Red Lines. My, my personal expectation is that there is some possible move. And what I, was, I would ask you a follow-up. What do you think the biggest obstacles are, the biggest hurdles to getting a, a good sort of deal that works for, for both sides? What, what is the biggest obstacle for? Is it the UK not knowing what it wants? Is it the European Union 27 member countries not willing to, willing to be flexible? What do you think is going to potentially get in the way of progress in these talks? Progress in these talks? Uh, <clears throat> the, I think that the negotiations are moving. We are moving slowly, just uh, bit by bit. And, uh, but I think that the mutual agreement is achievable. And uh, that's only the question of time. I think that we need uh, better understanding on the British side about the real options. Okay. Because uh, the, the room for the negotiation is uh, quite clearly defined. Yeah. There are some red lines on the British side, and there are clear positions on the European side. So that's, that's the room when we can try to reach an agreement, and we need to move closer. And, uh, during the recent months, we, ha we have already made uh, significant progress. Let's, let's say, uh, look at the situation a years ago. It seems that hard Brexit is a real option, and then we have made uh, real progress before the December European Council, before the March European Council, and maybe we, are, uh, we will see some progress uh, next week <laughs> in front of upcoming European Council. Okay. So, Thank you. Um, Aileen, I would ask you, I don't know if this is that one on. Um, we read a lot about, uh, in the UK at least, about the Northern Ireland border with the Republic of Ireland and how a key priority for the UK as well as the European Union is to avoid a hard border going up there. But obviously, from a Scottish perspective, there is already a clear difference in policy between Nicola Sturgeon's government in Scotland and London. Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, is, is determined, if she can, to keep Scotland in the European Union single market. Well, at least that was the policy a while ago, and I don't think it's changed. Um, is it possible for the UK to remain intact as a full country state? Uh, I, I don't believe it is possible because we're seeing radical fundamental differences between the policies and ideologies that the UK government are willing to pursue uh, and the agenda that is enshrined in Holyrood 
Um, the two institutions in themselves are very, very different. In, in London, we have a government that is based on a very traditional methodology of working, um, and in my view, doesn't represent the, the four nations that make up the UK apparently as equal partners. Uh, whereas in Edinburgh, we have a more modern, a more European uh, designed institution and that's one that certainly as a, as a young Scot, as someone living in Scotland today, it's an institution that feels far closer to me as a citizen and actually it represents something that I do want. So in terms of uh, how long the UK has, I think it's a matter of time. But what I would really like to see is cooperation across Britain as a, as a geographical entity because the struggles that the average person faces in Scotland are, are in no way removed from the struggles that are faced by the average people across Northern Ireland, England and Wales. In fact, I think the people in England are actually getting a very uh, a poor deal because they are the only nation without a devolved administration to call their own. Um, so as a result, although statistically they are very highly represented in London, um, I'm, I'm not convinced that their interest in a meaningful way that's going to enact sustainable uh, and tangible change in our lifetimes is, is actually what we've got. Thank you. Um, I suppose one question might be, do you think that there is a, a chance that somehow or other the peace might be threatened in, in, on, on the island of Ireland or anywhere else as a result of this, in the, in the EU, for example? In terms of peace, I think it, it's difficult to hypothesise because we're talking about people's lives. We're talking about um, a very fragile situation in the country of Ireland. Um, but between, between Scotland and the rest of the UK, I don't realistically see any problem. In Scotland, we're, we are a peaceful people. We have absolutely no, no interest in aggression, so I, I'm not concerned from that perspective. Okay. Um, I'll, actually, if you could pass the microphone along to Nick, that'd be good. Um, Nick, in the European Union, when the Brexit vote happened, it was a pretty unpopular decision, I think it's probably fair to say, elsewhere in Europe. I don't think they really wanted or expected a Brexit vote. Um, does that mean that everywhere you go, people really hate you? <laughs> well, no, it, it, it doesn't, actually. Um, you get very complicated reactions, not least in a country like this, where there is a sizable minority of people who look, I think, rather enviously uh, on the British decision. But um, no, absolutely not hated, uh, not disliked, and not, I think, particularly pitied. Um, you know, I was very interested to hear my Czech colleagues speaking about what might be the outcome of the current negotiation. And what I'm constantly struck by, actually, is how closely our national interests align. So um, recently there's been quite a focus on future security arrangements, both internal, which have to do with policing and DNA databases and extraditions and so on and so forth, uh, and external in the context of um, a growing uh, Russian engagement in Central Europe. And it seems to me that um, there is no reason at all why we shouldn't do a deal which recognizes that very high degree of overlap between the interests of a Britain outside Europe uh, and the European Union. Um, the, the risk, I think, is that more pragmatic voices are not always heard as clearly as they might be uh, in Brussels and perhaps in one or two other European capitals. Is, is the uh, the Czech Republic an ally, this is actually to Nick, um, or, or an adversary, and if, if, it, if it's helpful, where is it most helpful to the UK, it, on, on particularly on Brexit, obviously? I, I think it would be really crass of me either to go out looking for allies with a capital A, or uh, to describe particular member states as more or less allied. What I do think, after only five months in this country, is that when you begin to talk about where national interests are at stake, there is no doubt whatsoever that to a very high degree they overlap. I've mentioned security, but equally the example that's most often cited in this country is the British consumer's desire to buy Škoda cars, and the desire on the part of tens of thousands of workers in a town called Mlada Boleslav to produce the cars. It is in nobody's rational interest 
to complicate that trading relationship, which is why I'm pretty optimistic that if the voices of the 27 are heard clearly in Brussels and rational calculations prevail, uh, and they may not, then we should be able to do a deal that actually ensures that we all end up emerging as allies, uh, albeit on a new basis. Why might rational decisions not prevail? Um, it takes me back to your question. That's to say the degree to which our decision, our decision produced strong emotional reactions uh, for all kinds of reasons in all kinds of places. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask Christoph a question now, but he needs a microphone, so <laughs> if we can pass this one along. Um, is it possible, Christoph, that as a result of Brexit, the EU somehow or other might benefit, or is it inevitable that the picture will be worse in the uh, remaining 27 countries afterwards? It's, it's difficult to predict in, in, in the medium and longer term. But what, what has been noticeable, if not remarkable, uh, since the process started is how much uh, unity on the EU 25, or 27, sorry, still, um, EU 27 has, um, has prevailed, um, both in terms of um, EU member states agreeing to leave the EU and its institu institutions to, to deal with the process. Um, namely, national interest of the member states should not get in the way in a sense of undermining the, um, the European Union at a very critical point um, in its existence. Um, but beyond this um, agreement among the member states that the EU itself should deal with the matter on the basis of Article 50, uh, there was also um, an acknowledgement that this process is a moment to close ranks around some core principles which are um, of fundamental importance for, for the EU and its remaining member states. It's been a constitutional moment for the EU, uh, leading to what would, could call, if to use the, the Brexit terminology, um, uh, th there is an integration dividend on the side of the EU when it comes to Brexit. Brexit, paradoxically, has fostered integration um, uh, both institutionally and, and, and substantively. Now, that has happened in the context of Brexit. Um, whether the routines that have developed in the context of Brexit, which in some ways are reminiscent of the routines that developed institutionally and substantively in the context of enlargement, the way in which the EU uh, uh, flexibly developed some kind of methodology to prepare itself and the candidates for acceding to the EU, that kind of methodology somehow is reminiscent of what we see in, in, in Brexit. Whether that will have some kind of spillover effect in, 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 in allowing the EU and its institutions and its member states to address new challenges in other policy fields remains to be seen. But I would hope that this um, constitutional moment to, in the face of Brexit might indeed produce some positive spillover effects in the way in which the EU and its uh, key actors are able to address uh, uh, policy challenges we've been discussing the last uh, two and a half days. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions in on the Slido um, app here, which I will just read out. And I'll, I'm open to bids from the panel, frankly. If you guys want to want to get involved, just let me know. Um, so one, one question, the top-ranked question here at the moment is, do you believe that the other EU member states, depending on what Brexit will eventually look like, may be tempted to follow that model? <laughs> or do we have an interest, I'm reading the question, in being hard, I take that to mean, in potentially making Brexit so horrible for the UK that nobody else in their right minds would want to replicate it? Um, Nick. Sorry, forgive me, I just want a brief go at that. Um, because I hear quite a lot words to the effect that Britain must not get a good deal because that will encourage others. Um, one of the real sadnesses about this process would be if those who are committed to Europe, uh, the European Union in future, didn't try to learn the lessons of why Britain 
is turning its back on the European Union and draw some operational conclusions. Um, it's obviously not entirely clear, not perhaps remotely clear, what was going on in everybody's head when they cast their votes. But there was certainly something in there about a democratic deficit, certainly something in there about what was perceived to be the uh, steady growth of the power and influence of the Commission, some concerns about the expanding remit and case law associated with the European Court. Um, I would argue that we are not setting a precedent for anybody, and I take every opportunity to say in this country that Brexit does not equal or encourage Chexit. Uh, but if you want people to keep people to stay in and stay engaged, you really must look at why we decided to leave. Thanks, Nick. Um, Agatha, do you want to come in? Thank you very much. Um, and I would also like to comment on, on, on what Ambassadors has just said, but perhaps later on. Um, I remember the discussions in the UK, but also on the continent, uh, on whether uh, Brexit would cause this domino effect. I actually think I even remember being here and being asked whether the referendum in the UK could trigger, let's say, Chexit or Polexit, and you know, we, we could go on and on and on with other Nexit. Um, well, in fact, if you look into uh, public opinion polls, uh, they have shown a quite significant increase in support for the EU. Um, and, you know, if you ask polls, others, well, Czechs are probably still quite Euro skeptics, you know better than I do. Um, but the referendum hasn't had this uh, domino effect. Now, I think there, ha there was this discussion in the beginning that the EU should stick it to the bridge um, to show the others that they shouldn't follow this path. Now, I disagree with this uh, narrative. I think it's not about punishing the UK, really. It is about something what Christoph has, has said. It is about certain principles, right, um, and keeping the European project uh, uh, together. So um, I, I don't think, I don't think perhaps indeed, you know, there are some in Berlin, uh, if you, they will tell you, you can't let British pick and choose um, because others would like to follow. But I think the, the discussion is deeper than this. Uh, it is about the integrity of the European uh, project uh, as such. Do you mind if I actually comment on another comment, or shall I just? I, I just want to stay with actually okay. the Slido <laughs> questions, um, but we'll come we'll we'll come back. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's another one here which I want which has been up for a while actually, but. Could we expect a decline in Euroscepticism and populism in the European Parliament after Brexit? Will, will Euroscepticism actually lessen as a result of Brexit somehow? Um, who wants to take that? Spinyak, what do you think? Yeah. It's not an easy question, and I can present only my personal view on it, but uh, I do not believe that the Euroscepticism in the continental Europe is motivated by the Brexit, and that after Brexit it uh, should decline. What I am really afraid that the number of Euroskeptic uh, members of the European Parliament uh, unfortunately could be better after the elections in the two, 2019. But uh, I, I, I'm not convinced that the roots of Euroscepticism are related to, to Brexit. Christoph, did you want to come in on any of those two? I, I wanted to come in on the, on the previous uh, question, yeah. um, just to make the point that, um, if I can be so bold, the EU, um, I mean, based in hindsight, the EU should not be afraid of withdrawals. To begin with, a withdrawal is perfectly in line with the very decision to include an exit clause the last time the treaties were changed. Article 50 was not there simply not to be used, and I, I challenge the uh, Lord Kerr on, on, on this one. Um, I could, I could uh, explain why, but it's, it's for another discussion. Uh, the inclusion of Article 50, had um, a, a that was a very powerful message. 
Um, it basically meant that there is now an EU-based procedure for a member state to leave the Union if that member state feels increasingly uncomfortable with the way in which the EU operates. Not leaving the Union, therefore, entails loyalty. Um, the, the door is open, the EU is not a prison. It's uh, also a reminder of something we tend to forget about the European Union, which is an organization based on uh, a voluntary choice to exceed. It is not an empire, as, is, as it's been written by uh, an eminent uh, academic based in Oxford. It is an organization based on the will of states and peoples to, uh, to take part. And I think withdrawal, the, the withdrawal of the UK from the European Union is a very clear reminder of that. And this is why, as I said before, this is a constitutional moment for the EU. It is a reminder of what the EU is about. It is a voluntary organization. It is not a, um, it is not a, a, a prison. Um, the additional element is that uh, the UK has said time and again that it is leaving the European Union, but it is not leaving Europe. And based as I am in Norway, I can tell you that participating in the European integration process is not um, exclusively based on membership. There are alternative ways to participate in the European integration process outside the membership context. And this is the new, a, a new discussion that is opening up. The idea that differentiation within the European integration process may actually take place more outside the European Union than within. And, and there, in this discussion, we'll have to see how um, um, uh, participation can be um, somehow reshaped, um, not only around membership, but around other, other mechanisms. So I tend to have a, a more positive view with respect to withdrawal. And I give you, I'll give you another illustration of, of that. I think withdrawal of the UK from the EU or the withdrawal of any member state from the EU is much more in line with what EU law is about, given that there is an Article 50 to allow this to happen, than the deal that was cobbled together by the former Prime Minister uh, David Cameron and its counterparts in the European Council, which in my view was in complete contradiction with the EU's DNA. So, the withdrawal is, in my view, more in sync with the constitution of the EU than that infamous deal of February 2016. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm just... Aileen, I'm going to turn to you and ask you whether you think that a more flexible form of um, cooperation with Europe is ever going to be enough for Scotland. Scotland sees itself as European, so we would be looking for whatever practical and sustainable models of cooperation were feasible. Um, but in terms of how that looks constitutionally, at the moment in Scotland we don't have our own constitution. So I believe that independence is going to be the only way to facilitate that, because the Westminster government is pushing on with Brexit, um, which means that that's not a forum the EU is no longer a forum that Scotland is going to have. However, I think that an independent Scotland could be a very viable partner and an asset, I hope, to the EU. However, I'm sure there are many alternatives. We were here in the case of Norway. Um, of course, as been said, we're not, we're not leaving Europe, we're leaving the EU, and that's at an institutional level as opposed to a cultural level or uh, the level where people actually interact on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you think that, um, there's another question we've had, we've had in, but do you think that the quality of the debate uh, since the referendum somehow or other has m meant that the UK public is better educated about what the EU does and is and, and how Brexit might impact on, on their lives? Absolutely not. The original okay. <laughs> quality of the debate in the UK, in my view, was very poor. It was restricted to a very specific window on the political spectrum, um, and it was overseen by a centre-right and right-wing mainstream media forum. Again, to put Scotland on the table, I would invite you to compare that to the, the independence referendum we had two years before that, which was a very lively civic-led debate that occupied a wide range of the, the political spectrum and actually involved the occupation of public spaces. Um, certainly speaking from a, a Glasgow perspective, there was actually a carnival-esque atmosphere whereby folk were out actually just talking to their neighbours. You could walk past a building site and hear people actually talking about economic policy on a Friday 
Friday night, and it it was amazing. Um, and I absolutely can't say that there was anything remotely comparable during the Brexit debate, which I think is an absolute shame. And so comparing the two qualities of discussion as chaired, if you like, by, by the governments and the media, um, we have two very different cultures emerging, one that I believe to be compatible with a modern Europe and one perhaps not. Thank you. Now, we've got about 20 minutes for questions from uh, from the floor, from anybody who would like to raise a question, please put your hand up and uh, there's a question here. Um, if you could, if you could uh, say your name and where you're from and, and keep the question, we'll try and keep the answers short as well. Yes, Ivo Kaplan from Prague. <clears throat> I, I think that uh, Brexit is a wrong term for, for leaving uh, United Kingdom or for having uh, the next uh, upgraded, uh, upgraded shape, I don't know. Try this. Thank you. Uh, Ivo Kaplan from Prague. So uh, I think uh, that Brexit is a wrong term of uh, uh, of leaving Britain not to be a part of upgraded uh, European communities. I think there is a danger uh, that for Czechs is also actual this, uh, this problem because uh, Czechs are also not so prepared uh, to be upgraded and uh, be a part of uh, the political union which is uh, now planned uh, by France, Germany, Italy, Spain and some, some others. <coughs> You can uh, compare the crisis in Italy and uh, the crisis in Britain uh, or in other states. It's, it's absolutely different because even Italian extra right uh, party to, to together with extra left party, they, uh, in, in the, the end of the day, they agreed that they will be in the Eurozone and they will be a part of the core of, uh, of today's uh, European communities. So, uh, <clears throat> there is uh, my, my question, uh, <clears throat> uh, what will be the future of uh, this uh, England? Because uh, as I heard from the Scottish uh, <laughs> lady, uh, I think Scotland will be not satisfied with uh, the situation. And there is a, a border between Northern uh, Ireland and uh, Ireland, uh, which is going through houses in one village. So, so uh, they will destroy uh, the, the houses or how they could do. So I think the reality will be that Britain will be like it, it, it was uh, in the last decades, uh, a part of customs union and a part of uh, the defense initiative which are going from Paris uh, because otherwise uh, United Kingdom couldn't, or not the United Kingdom, England couldn't live uh, without uh, the, the others. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. So England is going to be part of the customs union. Um, that's, that's certainly one, um, one point that was just made there. Um, is, that, is that how it's going to go? Agatha, and uh, is there anything else that you would like to pick up on from that contribution? Yes. Uh, I, I guess you wanted me to comment on customs arrangement. I think an, an ambassador will prob is probably better placed to elaborate on where the government is heading, because I must admit I'm slightly confused. Um, but it seems to me, you know, if you read again the official position um, of the uh, Conservatives and hands also the British government. The UK is leaving the customs union and is leaving the single market. The problem is that the uh, British government has also committed to avoiding hard border um, in Northern Ireland, so on, on the island of Ireland, and also does not want to have a border on the Irish Sea. So we have those three principles, and um, it's very difficult to reconcile all, all of this. Um, so, if I were to put my money, um, I would probably say the UK is heading towards <laughs> some customs. The British, uh, the British will call it customs arrangement. Um, the, EU, uh, the EU will actually allow them to call it this way, just for the sake of, <laughs> for the sake of uh, progressing. 
and, but it, it, will, it will create some problems within the cabinet because the more aligned you are with, with the EU, the more difficult it will be to swallow for um, people, people like uh, you know, Boris Johnson um, or Mr. Fox because the, you know, the more aligned you are, the, the less difficult it is actually to strike independent, um, independent trade deals. So uh, I think there is still um, ahead of us another crunching moment. Uh, which will probably come uh, with the next uh, vote in the British Parliament on the trade bill. That's also probably when we will know more actually on where the, where the UK is, uh, is heading toward. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing is, the thing is, and I, I, I guess I would like to comment on what has been said, what, what Christoph, uh, Christoph has said and what, what, what Ambassador also elaborated on. Yes, the UK has decided, the UK decided, or the British people decided, uh, to, to leave the EU on June 23rd, 2016. But at the same time, if you follow the narrative of the British government, well, the British government is saying, well, we are leaving, but actually we would like many things to remain the same. But the problem is that once you're a third country, and you want many things to remain the same on your side, this requires a lot of changes on the EU side, because the cooperation with a third country looks totally different than, than cooperation within EU member states. And I couldn't agree more with, with what, what uh, Ambassador said. Yes, we have common interest in keeping Europe safe, in keeping uh, our neighborhood safe, um, the problem is about how we can cooperate together without compromising certain, uh, certain principles. For example, you know, if the UK were allowed to remain part of the European arrest warrant, say, well, that would, rem that would require changing German constitutions and other constitutions as well. So what I'm trying to say, uh, that indeed it is in our joint interest, you know, to, to, to keep on uh, cooperating on, on, on security matter on foreign policy, uh, uh, but it, it will have to be slightly different, slightly different format. By the way, actually, I think that the UK is now, if there is anything positive about Brexit, the UK is now actually becoming more ambitious on, on, on in certain in certain areas like like, like defence. Even you know, it didn't like Galileo. Now it, it you know it loves it. So we'll see. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Yes, there's a. A lady here just in the middle. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Teresa Novotna. I am. Sorry. Maybe we could get the handheld mic along there, please. Thanks. Uh, hello. Uh, so, yeah, Teresa Novotna. I'm a Czech, uh, Czech academic based in Brussels and also uh, a collaborator researcher with the European one of the organizers. Um, I mean, the speakers mentioned or listed quite a few reasons why the British public voted the way in which it voted in the referendum. Uh, but for me, uh, the reason why Brexit happened is basically a failed attempt of party management within the Tory party, starting with David Cameron, but, you know, Theresa May is not doing a much better job. Um, so. Um, and that actually could be a warning for other member states, you know, that uh, bad party politics can lead to such significant uh, decisions for the entire country. But in terms of the future of the UK, my question is, how do you see the future of the Tories? You know, are they going to split along the hard Brexit years, Remainers, and to some extent the Labour too? And, you know, does uh, Theresa May have a chance to actually survive Brexit? Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to test Nick's diplomatic skills here. <laughs> I don't, uh, uh, would you like to contribute in any sense to, to, uh, to that? No, I mean, my diplomatic <laughs> skills tell me to say not a word. <laughs> you have the mic, unfortunately. So so I, I that's not an option. Something which I, I thought was perhaps more germane to the debate, which Agnes was talking about, and engage with my fellow, fellow panelists just for a moment, if I may, because, of course, you're right that, that the real tension in the European position as the British Europeans cross the negotiating table is, is this sort of interplay between concerns about how to make things work for us and concerns about important points of, of principle, which, which other panelists have also referred to. Where uh, we get, frankly, a, a little bit impatient is when we hear repeatedly 
the assertion that the British can't have a special deal. And that is irritating for two reasons. The first is that it implies that we're asking for stuff that is fundamentally a favor for us. And as I hope people will have picked up from what I said earlier on, um, we genuinely believe that what we're asking for, um, maybe 90%, I don't know, is genuinely in the interests of the 27 as well as ourselves. Uh, hence my example of Skoda car exports, hence my example of participation in uh, extradition arrangements. And the second point is this, that very often we hear across the table, and I'd be interested in Agnes's view on this, that the British can't have a special arrangement, as if special arrangements weren't the norm in Europe. Every European partner outside the European Union gets a special arrangement. The Swiss have a different arrangement from the Norwegians, from the Ukrainians, from the Turks. Uh, take it as far as you like. So the real question, I think, for our interlocutors is to what extent we share that strong sense that the best post-Brexit relationship is, in most respects, a close one. And if that closeness is also of value to the 27 and to the European Union as a whole, then it's actually not violating any principle or setting up any appalling new precedent to try and make legal arrangements that allow us to continue to cooperate uh, in areas where we both want to, even better than before. Thank you. Well, um, I do want to take some more questions, but on the on will the Tories split? Is I mean, I I certainly think that uh, the Prime Minister, despite the fact she's in charge of a divided party and a hung Parliament, <laughs> is proving sort of more resilient than anybody would have imagined. I think Agatha was, was, was saying this earlier on before we came on stage. But um, I, I don't think the Conservative Party will split for the very simple reason that they know that would be disastrous electorally. And they're quite you know, keen on hanging on to power, I think. But let's get another question from the audience, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Um, gentleman at the back in the pink shirt. Hi, uh, my name is Thomas Sishar. I, uh, I'm British Czech, so I have many discussions with myself about Brexit. Um, I feel like it's, it is obviously an emotional topic, and I had a good cry about it afterwards, and I'm sort of over it now, and I wish other people would also do the same, because it's pretty clear that there is a future with the UK outside of Europe, or the European Union, but within Europe. And I would like to hear from anybody's own experiences as to whether people are genuinely talking about what positive things can come out of it, rather than talking about, you know, will Britain be treated badly in one way or another? Because a lot of it, what I read in the papers, is very much about a sort of face-off between the two negotiators. And that's Good, makes for good reading, but it's not really necessarily be beneficial for everybody. Um, or do you feel that a lot of people are still having very emotional discussions about it? Aileen. Um, so certainly speaking from a Scottish perspective, if you ask people what they think about the referendum, they think you mean about Scottish independence. So really the, the framework of discussion has, has certainly shifted back in Scotland. But I think if, if anything good is to come out of Brexit, it really has to be a, a massive learning curve for politicians and for citizens alike. So in this case, I would read Brexit as a very frustrated expression of two main things, certainly in England. The first would be British nationalism, and the second would be um, a very, very understandable austerity agenda that has slashed, res slashed resources across the country in terms of education, uh, healthcare, uh, infrastructure. Um, and the difference that I can see from a Scottish perspective is that during our independence debate, we got a lot of those frustrations out. A lot of people in Scotland who perhaps hadn't considered themselves politically literate before, and I, I definitely count myself in that, in that demographic, were able to articulate their concerns, articulate their frustrations, find a new vocabulary, and work out pathways forwards, um, or at least to, to understand better their own predicament. Whereas the situation south of the border was not was not like that at all. So almost like the 
the teenage angst, if you like, of trying to find your, your place in the world under a, a, a government that is pushing on with an austerity agenda, then manifested in a very frustrated vote where people were saying things like, I want to take back control, without any real sort of sense of what taking or back or control would even mean. So uh, uh, to answer your question more directly, we have to see this as a learning curve, a learning opportunity, really. Thank you. Let's get some more questions. Uh, there's a question here in the front row. Thank you. Um, my name is Mete. I'm actually from London as well, and I represent the all-party parliamentary group on a better Brexit for young people. Um, I just want to touch upon sort of some of the points that have already been made from the previous one. I think the more we discuss what happened in the referendum, one of the key things that come out of the referendum that is that Britain has become much more of a divided country between young and old, between towns and cities, and between graduates for non-graduates. And I think that the tone of the referendum was obviously unhelpful in exacerbating those sort of differences. And I think the more we keep asking the question about whether Brexit was right or wrong, I think it's the wrong approach and it keeps exacerbating those differences. And I, I say this as someone who, who voted to remain, um, but I think that we really, really do need to think about the future relationship. And I, and I agree with uh, the ambassador that, you know, these special arrangements and new arrangements that we speak about, I had a meeting with Michel Barnier and he said, look, our lines are these, these are clear red lines. And I said, well, you know, these must have been the red lines when Norway was first coming to you and why can't we create these new deals for, for young people particularly who want to have a good working relationship with the EU in the future. Thank you for that question. Um, Agatha wants to come in. I just wanted to come in because also the ambassador uh, asked about my views. And I, in, in a way, I do understand the British frustration with Michel Barnier's third case. Um, and I do... This is the famous slide, isn't it? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> For... Stairway, which doesn't mm. which ends with... I think annihilation or something, I'm not sure. It's bad anyway. Yeah, yeah, but also the British Parliament, if you, I th was it the House of Lords report which actually said, and I think the Commons also sent a similar message uh, to Brussels that in a way um, every relationship is different. I mean, I agree with this, yes. Even if you compare um, FDAs, they are different because they are basically um, concluded with different, uh, different countries. On Swiss model, because I think you, you also underline the Swiss model, this is something which uh, it seems to me the UK could be heading towards the single market uh, in goods. That's more or less what Swiss have, but if you basically say this to the EU, well, actually, uh, Swiss got a special uh, arrangement, then the EU will tell you, well, yes, but we don't <laughs> like it. Whoops. <laughs> That's what happens when we are talking about those things. Um, but the EU does not like this arrangement any longer, right? It has been negotiating with the Swiss for quite a long time, and it's actually close to, and I guess Christoph can, can say more about this, to changing the relationship and actually um, uh, securing a greater role of the, of the Court of Justice in, in uh, ensuring that this relationship works. So, uh, again, well, you know, the, the, the EU would say we are also learning our own mistakes. Um, on on, on, on both gentlemen's comments, I, yes, I agree with you. I think it's, it's counterproductive, and, and I also feel frustrated when I attend meetings where we keep on coming back to what happened in 2016 rather than looking forward and thinking what we can do to narrow, basically, either the differences, as you said, or, you know, look, or looking for positive sides. Now, if you ask me whether I see anything positive, you'll probably get a wonky response. But one positive thing that is coming out of this exercise is that I finally see the British Parliament with worse or better or worse effects, but at least trying to exercise the scrutiny powers and challenging the government, which wasn't happening before. Another positive example that I'm seeing, and actually I'm looking at the gentleman which is sitting uh, in front of you, we are having, we are 
conducting a project together with uh, SEPs in Brussels, where we are looking at direct democracy instruments, and we are in charge of the British uh, report. What I do like about this exercise um, is that after the referendum, actually, we started having a discussion about positively engaging uh, people uh, in the decision-making process. Of course, you could say, well, we should have thought about this earlier, but the fact that we are now talking about citizens, juries, you know, how to make people uh, take informed decisions about things they are being asked, that's already a positive example. No matter whether you will have another referendum or not, yeah, that's, that's a positive signal coming out of the Brexit. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to ask as a quick follow-up from some of the themes uh, uh, where, where you think that a bespoke deal for the UK is something that, uh, that the Czech Republic would like to see. Is there a problem from your point of view with the UK getting a bespoke deal? Cherry. Uh, to be honest, I think that the model of future deal or future agreement without the EU and uh, the UK is still open. And uh, I feel the need a little bit to uh, defend the European approach because the uh, EU is not so strict and uh, refusing an agreement. Uh, at the beginning of the negotiation, all mentioned models was in the, in the game. The first impression was that after the referendum, there will be something like Norwegian model. Then the Brit uh, UK declared uh, no participation in the single market, no participation in the customs unions. So the number of model was, <coughs> was uh, eliminated. That's, and uh, we can find, uh, find an agreement uh, in the room given the circumstances. That's, uh, that's the fact. And uh, I think that Europe is uh, open to change its view according to latest European Council uh, conclusions. There, there is a sentence that the Europe is open to accommodate its, uh, its position and, uh, <coughs> in case that the UK uh, is able to reconsider its red light. So I, I think that there is a still room for agreement. And uh, just to comment the debate uh, and some questions, uh, I do not think that the Brexit has to be a disaster and that we have to understand it as a disaster. I think that our common task, both on the Europe and the UK, should be to find the best solution for both parties. I think that there is a lot of areas where we need to cooperate the security, defense, that's uh, I think the best examples when the Europe needs the UK and I hope UK needs the EU. But I think it's, it's um, just to conclude, I think that there is the room to move forward. That's my personal opinion. I, I am an optimist or I try to be an optimist. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are, I think, pretty much out of time. There have been some excellent questions and contributions. Thank you all. I'm just going to ask a quick, and I hope the, the answers will be very quick as well, but you need your numbers, you need your numbers here, panelists, because I'm going to ask you what percentage chance you think there is of no deal at the end of these talks? Is it a 10% chance, a 50% chance of no deal? And we'll go along the line, and you can, you can start, Spinyak. It's a, it's a tricky question, even if you are a government official. So, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, my personal expectation is that 10%. 10%, okay. Nick? It should be zero. Should be zero. It's all conjecture. <laughs> um, I'm no gambler, <laughs> so I'm not going to bet on this one. Um, I think there is still a chance that uh, there could be, that the UK could live without a deal. And I think that actually in the last weeks this, this uh, possibility slightly increased. And I think if there is anything that could derail those negotiations, that will be Northern Ireland. Yeah, 50-50. 50-50, wow, that's pretty high. Thank you, Christoph. And thank you all uh, for coming to this session. And if you could join me in thanking our panelists on the stage here as well. Thanks so much.